Welcome to another edition of The Untold Story of the Protestant Reformation, episode 16, The Peasants' War. Very similar to the last episode as we discussed the Knight's Revolt, should be called the Knight's War, the Peasants' War should actually be called the Peasants' Revolt because it is the peasants who are revolting against the ruling class. It's a social class revolt grounded in the inequality of wealth distribution. Some will even call it the first clash of capitalism versus communism. So let's take a look at all the factors that are influencing this eruption of unrest. The first is inflation. I spoke about this before. The value of the florin and the ducat, I'll call them the dollar for the sake of this uh, video, they are uh, declining, which is causing goods and services to increase in price. This affects everyone from the ruling class, princes, dukes, and magistrates, to the middle class, to the peasants. To combat inflation, the ruling class are doing a number of things that cause a snowball effect. Number one, they're diluting the coins so that they cost less to produce, but they also weigh less, which is dropping the value of the florin or ducat or, or dollar to decline even more. On top of that, they're increasing taxes. In the court system, the lawyers are passing laws that are giving more control to the princes, dukes, and magistrates and pushing the peasants back into feudalism and serfdom. At the same time, there are also legal battles that are going on trying to break up the monopolies and trust busting the textile business, the spice business, and banking. Jacob Fugger is a prime target for those people trying to break up the monopolies. Meanwhile, there is this religious divide that is splintering the country into shreds. Martin Luther is no longer the leading reformer. He's got enemies on both sides. In fact, when he gives sermons, many of his sermons are interrupted by what they call radical Protestants or Anabaptists. With all that going on, there is still a propaganda campaign instigating the peasants into believing that the Catholic Church is corrupt and run by Satan. By 1524, Germany is just a tinderbox ready to blow. In the fall of 1524, the revolt starts in the Black Forest, located in southwest Germany. A countess there wants snail shells for her decorations and necklaces and orders her peasants to retrieve snail shells from the river. She orders this command during the fall harvest when the peasants are bringing in the crops for the winter. The peasants ignored her command and did a walk off and that's when the revolt started. The revolt caught on like wildfire sweeping across central and southern Germany, going into Austria, Switzerland, and Hungary. But it's not a unified revolt. It's broken off into several different factions with different leaders and motives. We can categorize those factions and leaders into three different groups or types. The first group is the civilized group. These were middle-class men who were literate and actually trying to promote change among society. They led their swarms of peasants into negotiations with rulers, such as the Swabian League, which I discussed in, in the previous episode. These guys are the ones that drew up the 12 Articles of the Peasants' War, which you can find online. It was 12 demands by the peasants to create a social change. Those demands grew over time in negotiations. The list got larger and larger. The second type of faction or leader was the uncivilized. These were hordes of peasants led by somewhat of a bandit 
whose sole motivation was to loot and for booty. They traveled from town to town, raiding every single church, monastery, and tavern, and then when they were all done, they burned every single building and moved to the next town. These types of groups were labeled drunkards and seemed to make up a large portion of the peasants' war because contemporary writers uh, wrote several things about it, such as, had it not been for the bloodshed, the peasants' war could have been called the carnival of jest or the wine war. One person noted that while half the country burns, the other half is drunk. The last faction or leader is the religious zealots. These are probably the most famous, uh, Thomas Munzer being one of them. These were groups that were led by converted priests who had religious agendas. Those agendas were kill the priests, monks, bishops, and burn the churches and monasteries down. Now, how were they defeated? Let's go back to the very first group, the civilized men who were in negotiations. Their problem was they really did want change and they spent too much time negotiating. The rulers tricked them by stalling, making them believe that they would give in to some of their demands. The spokesperson for the rulers kept going back saying, what does this mean? Could you revise this demand? And we need more clarity here. Meanwhile, the rulers were raising an army that would squash the peasants. As for the uncivilized or the marauding bandits, they were easy to put down because they didn't spend any time gathering weapons or cannons to fight. They spent too much time looting, looking for gold and wine. In some cases, the bandit leaders were bribed into putting their forces in harm's way. One person said that the roads were lined with peasant bodies for miles. The last group are the religious zealot groups. These people also never bothered to gather arms or cannons to fight. The most famous of these is Thomas Munzer, who was somewhat of a disciple of Andreas Karlstadt. You might remember me talking about him in a previous episode. Munzer and five to 8,000 peasants have taken over the town of Milhausen. They've converted the town into a commune where nobody owns anything. There's no private property or private goods. This is taken from the Bible, uh, many of you probably know, Acts of the Apostles. When the church is first starting out, all the disciples share their belongings and property with the church. So it's a commune. No one owns anything. And as you can probably guess, this is the beginnings of communism, the distribution of wealth. It's taken from sola scriptura. Duke George and Philip of Hesse gather their armies and surround Milhausen. The inhabitants inside with Thomas Munster flee the city to a nearby hill where they're going to make a standoff. Any of Thomas Munster's people who want to surrender, he has them executed. After giving his people an apocalyptic sermon, he tells them that God is on their side and when he opens up his hands, they will absorb all the bullets that come their way, and they charge into battle. The peasants are wiped out, and Munzer fled the scene only to be caught later on by Duke George. He was beheaded the following day. The peasants' revolt ended in Germany in April of 1525, but it still continued in Austria and Hungary. As far as Martin Luther is concerned, many of you probably know his, his popularity plummeted because he continually stayed on the side of the rulers. At the beginning of the revolt, when it started, he wrote publications telling them not to revolt because of that 
line we spoke about in Romans chapter 13, verse 1, where it says that God put the rulers in place. Then later on, when no one listened to him, he still sided with the nobles and rulers and told them to put the peasants down like mad dogs. He called them Satan's army as well. With buildings still smoldering and bodies still lining the roads, some princes and dukes converted over to Lutheranism and seized all the property of the Catholic Church. But that is the discussion for the next episode. Thank you for watching.